Welcome to Knightsbridge Music and each Friday I speak with a musician or a business leader. It's lovely to welcome Dr. Corey Hall, pianist, recording artist and scholar. His YouTube channel Bark Scholar has 130,000 subscribers, which amusingly is 129,935,000 more than this channel. Corey, welcome. I wonder if you might tell us a bit about your success on YouTube and how you came to make your first videos and how you found the whole experience. Okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on your on your podcast, Ben. Yeah, that that uh, that story. Well, I will remember that forever. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting story. What happened was um, in 2006, YouTube was basically just being invented. I had never heard of YouTube before in 2006. Around probably around 2007 or so, I had a, a colleague where I was teaching um, at, at I was teaching at a local college here, and he introduced me to some videos. He said, "Hey, you have to see this video of Martha Argerich." And I said, "What do you mean a video of Martha?" Ar-? And he said, "Well, it's on," and he sent me a link to it, and it was on this thing called YouTube which I had never heard of. Nobody knew about it then. Probably just 18 year olds and high school students. And so, you know, I watched, started to watch YouTube videos around in those years, 2007, probably. Then, um, actually I had, no, maybe 2006. I had, but I have this Steinway here is a 1929, uh, Steinway Model L. It's like my baby. Anyway, I purchased this in 2006 from a local Steinway dealer here. I'm not rich. I actually had a loan. It was this was like buying a BMW. I had a 10 year loan to pay off this <laughs> this piano. So I didn't just go in with cash and buy it. It was worth so it. I, so I went in and and. Um, I ended up, I wasn't even planning on getting a piano. I, at the time I had a little upright. I had an upright, uh, Baldwin upright, a nice Baldwin upright. And then, so I went in, I was in, happened to be in the piano store, not even, not even planning to buy a piano. The next thing I knew, two days later, I had this loan and I had this piano delivered to my home. And I thought, well, gosh, I have this great piano now. And then YouTube was being, you know, becoming popular around that time. So I said, well, gosh, I may as well just jump on the bandwagon and try to make these videos on, on, on YouTube like everybody seems to be doing now. This was in 2008. So in 2008, I made my, I remember it was September 20, I think September 21st, uh, 2008. I, I, I don't know why I did this. I stayed up all night long. I stayed up to like three in the morning recording all of 15 Bach two-part inventions. And I thought, I thought for some reason, oh, I have to do them all. You know, I, I, I didn't just do one and then do another one another day. And then, oh, I have to do them all. So I don't know why I thought that, but I was torturing myself. So I recorded them all, memorized all in one night you know, several takes for all of them. I didn't just go through all in one take. I seldom do that. Recorded all the Bach inventions, uploaded them. Those are my first, very first YouTube videos was those 15 two-part inventions with the long ponytail and the beard and everything. And um, I guess the rest is history, as they say. Then it, it just became, it became sort of my second job in addition to what I was doing. I was doing some little bit of private teaching, not as much as I do now, but I was teaching mostly part-time at a college and I was a church organist as well at a, at a uh, pretty large uh, church nearby, actually about a 30 minute drive from here. So 2008, I made my first YouTube videos and then I just started just churning them out after that. I was, uh, at the time, I was single. I wasn't married and 
I, I could just sit here all day long and make videos and not bother anyone. And so that's basically when the next five or six years after that, until until um, I was I was married uh, again, actually, <laughs> hopefully my last marriage, um, uh, then I could do anything I wanted. I would get up at six. I'm an early riser. I would get up at six in the morning and make videos at six in the morning. And I can't do that anymore because I'd wake up the house. You know, but so I was very, very productive those in those early years because I didn't have anything else. That's basically all I did. I taught at the college, played at the church and just made YouTube videos all day long. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It, it sounds like that you were you were perhaps in, in a good place at the right time. And you also put a lot of effort into the creation of the content early on. Yes. So you know you, you you enabled quite an impressive journey, and that that explains you know where you where you are. For exactly, somebody, I was at the right place, right time. Yeah, yeah. but for, for somebody starting out now, do you think there's still space in YouTube to get something of of, of quality and of use out of it, or do you think it's kind of it's had its era? Do, do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Okay, I've been thinking about that. I think about that from time to time, and I think it's always going to be relevant. It's always going to be something good. It's always going to be a good tool. The problem now in 2022, you know, 13 years later, 14 years later, is that it's just there is so much material now. That could be a good thing. It could you, you have to sort of weed out the good from the not so good. So I think it's great because my I myself I'm in, interested in a lot of other things other than music, so I just you know I'll get up in the morning and either listen to music. If I listen to music, it's a, almost always on YouTube. I'll like put on my headphones and do work at my computer and listen to whatever on YouTube, uh, either live or recorded albums, or I might watch a podcast. I like watching podcasts and or listening to podcasts and all kinds of things. If it weren't for YouTube, I wouldn't be able to do that. So but in that's non music related, but in music and in piano, particularly, I think there's there's always room for more. Always, there's always room for more. But it's it's hard to get into it. If you just get into it, it's hard to build up a following now. It was much easier back then in like 2006, seven and eight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To build up a following. Yeah. Do, do you feel that, um, do you feel that Bach is, is still relevant in 2022? I mean, can I preface this with the fact that I think Bach is very relevant? <laughs> but how do you um, how do you make it make Bach approachable and appealing to a new audience? Well, uh, Bach, yeah, of course, I agree with you. Bach will always be relevant. It will never go out uh, as just as the other classical composers. That's why it's called classical. Uh, is that it will always be in style. It's like, you know, the color black, you know, black clothing will always be in style. Well, Bach is in spot was the one who inspired most of the other composers after him. So, you know, if you take Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Liszt, Chopin, Schumann, you know, down the line, they were all pretty much inspired by Bach. If, if they had to list their number one inspiration or their favorite composer, probably 90% of them would pick Bach or Mozart, but Bach came before Mozart. So Bach was the father of them all in terms of common practice music, uh, you know, after post Baroque music. You know, I mean, you can always go earlier than that before Bach, but Bach laid the foundation for harmony and and all sorts of um, all, all sorts of aspects of music. He laid the foundation for that. So I think he'll always be relevant. Even rock musicians and even even heavy metal musicians and jazz musicians are inspired by Bach. 
you, you saw that the the movement of um, Jacques, Jacques Lussier making the, the 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 jazz music out of Bach, you know, um, back in I don't know when it was the sixties maybe, but and also I suppose the when children are uh, learning at school that the, the mathematical links between playing Bach and and perhaps you know what they're learning in their maths classes I think it's something that could be perhaps um, you know encouraged more do, do you think music more generally has a uh, positive impact on children oh that most definitely does um, and the classical will always be second to more popular styles that are whatever seem to be popular in the day you know today it's it's hip-hop with with kids who are in high school and with the youth today it's mostly hip-hop it's not like when i was growing up it was what we call now classic rock um you know when i was in high school it was classic rock heavy metal van halen that, that sort of thing it will um uh, but it, it Bach and classical music will always be there for those who express an interest in it. And it's interesting that you bring up this topic because it reminds me of when I was that age, when I was, I must have been about 10 years old or eight, maybe eight years old or 10 years old. I, uh, my, that was one of my first exposures to Bach was switched on Bach. If you remember those those albums from uh, Walter Carlos, well, it was then Walter Carlos, then Walter became Wendy Carlos later, but it was that Moog synthesizer, and the switched on Bach was huge in the '70s when I was that age. You know, so I love that. I I had the switched on Bach album. I must I wore out that album. I played it so much. I I think I played that album thousands of times. I became obsessed with it. It, it had I remember invention number eight it, on it. It had invention number fourteen on it. It had a couple movements from Brandenburg concertos, I think, and some other things. It was that age that planted the seed in me. From then on, I was like a, a Bachian for some things, and and I remember. I, I worked on Bach inventions when I was that age. I started piano when I was six, going on seven. One month before I was seven, I started piano. So I remember that I was obsessed with that album and I wanted to play the Bach inventions or at least the famous ones at that time. So I still have my Bach invention book that I had then and I still use it now. <laughs> it's like falling apart. <laughs> So that it, that music has been always been a part of my my upbringing, you know, as well as uh, ragtime. I can tell a similar s story about that, but that sort of ev was evolving at the same time for me. Yeah, it's, there's a, a wonderful quote I think from one of your articles. Um, Rach Rachmaninoff is also said to have performed like a dead horse in that he barely moved at all. And always had a boring, dour look on his face. I, I love, I love, I love this idea of a, a a piano player is able to have this, as you say, this economy of motion. And I think in you know today's um, virtuosic world, where we all want sort of show off to one another, actually finding a real stillness in playing, I think, can be important. Is that still of importance to you now? That oh, kind of, you know, oh, of, that's of primary importance. Uh, of course, nobody, it's no mystery, you know, anybody who's seen my videos and heard me play, that's no mystery. I don't move a lot. Um, uh, in fact, I move so little that people, there's people that claim I play with no feeling. <laughs> you don't have any feeling, you know. Well, that's, that's not true. We all know that. But what is true is that economy of motion is, is very important, I think. One of the most important things technically in playing the piano. Um, all of, most of the great pianists of the earlier 20th century, Horowitz, Claudio Arau, Rubinstein, to a lesser degree Rubinstein, but uh, the majority of that school of pianism was of the not 
don't move very much school. Horowitz hardly moved at all. Uh, Rachmaninoff hardly moved at all. Horowitz is, you know, you can still see videos of Horowitz playing. He's, he's like, looks like he's dead. He's just sitting here like this. And all of this, this massive sound coming out of the piano. And you think, how can he do that? Well, because he had economy of motion down to a science. He knew how to use this mechanism without the flashy uh, bravura techniques of, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, the Liberace techniques. Liberace was a great pianist. If Liberace wanted to, he could have easily gone that route. But Liberace's whole shtick was to, he was a showman. So there's a difference between doing it for show and moving a lot because you have to, because you've never learned the proper techniques. So one thing I'm against is the you know, the going in and out with your arms and, you know, and too much rotation and, you know, people are doing, pianists are doing all this crazy rotation and, and you don't have to do that. Watch Horowitz play. He never does that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not claiming that I'm Horowitz, but Horowitz never did that stuff. And he's one of the greatest pianists ever. I, I can hear my my piano teacher from school shouting elbows Turk, keep your elbows in you know I can I can hear it now um, right and and it's funny because if you I'm very interested in economy of motion in fact I'm one of these years I'm going to come out with a book about piano technique and that's going to be a major part of that book well there's a great video you can watch on YouTube it's um a video of uh, John Browning, who was a very um, successful American pianist who studied at Juilliard with Rosina Levine. And John Browning discusses the Levine, uh, Rosina, and um, the, the whole Levine system. Um, her husband was, um, his name, First name slips my mind, but um, I'll probably think of it in a minute. But Levine was a master technician and he hardly moved at all either. But in that video, the John Browning explains how, um, how Levine had, Levine um, advocated putting books, like practicing with, with books underneath your arms like this. So, so you would, so your elbows wouldn't go out. So he advocated keeping your elbows close to your body. And when I, my first teacher, when I was undergraduate, who was my best teacher ever, I think, uh, was, he used to have me do that too. I didn't know why he did that, but he was also of that school of keeping your elbows more close to your body and not, uh, going all out with them like that, it, I understand it now because it allows the weight of your arms to come down and to rest freely. That's, that's the natural. It's not natural to put your elbows out. It is natural just to let them hang here. So um, uh, the Levine system is all based on that. Uh, it goes contrary to what a lot of us learn now. A lot of us learn now you have to do a lot of that flailing in and out and that you have to, because you're not loose, you're too tight if you're like this, but that's not true. I mean, the Levines uh, taught that. John Browning, great American pianist, taught that. You know, that that it's, uh, it's a misunderstanding that it leads to, to tension because it doesn't. So I, I think that economy of motion is really, uh, it's, it's not well, it's not talked about very much by piano teachers and by, by piano students. And I, I suppose if, if you're, you know, if you're, if you are keeping your elbows in and you're applying um, directly to the keyboard, you can then more easily create a nice resonant tone rather than, you know, this sort of uh, putting more effort in, in a slightly convoluted way. So, oh, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, Joseph, Joseph Levine. I'm sorry. It came to you. It did. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah. 
Joseph Levine, great pianist. He has some great recordings too, the Maybe. Winter Wind Etude and some other things that he plays. So Joseph Levine was of that school. Right. Uh, you know, he was of that generation from Horowitz and and even before, I mean, he was born before Horowitz. So uh, it goes back to, I think back, way back to Cherney, you know, Carl Cherney. Uh, you know, he was a very efficient pianist. You know, he pro I don't think Cherney really taught um, showmanship and you know that sort of thing that bravado and all of that lang yeah. lang and you know yeah. that the whole lang lang school of piano hmm. i can that, I mean, i'm that, not i'm not saying anything bad about lang lang he's a great musician it's just that his his antics are <laughs> something else you know <laughs> just, so, yeah. to, just to watch him play you know <laughs> It, uh, that 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 journey again is is cut. I can see it in a distant. I think I've um, you know those things that you have to uh, wipe from your mind because they caused you so much um, uh, fear when you when you did them. But they were very good exercises, you know. And uh, I, <laughs> yeah. so, um, I found another great quote. I think from you: uh, "Tweed coats and ivory towers had miraculously morphed into Hawaii shirts, a video camera, and a Steinway." And I just think that um, that that's funny. I know, you guys, I know you remember where that came from. That I just I I came across online. I just thought that is so splendid. And um, do you do you miss any aspects of academia? generally or do you try and incorporate them or what do you think that's funny i forgot about that is that one of my quotes i am not sure i can't remember oh, to be okay. honest yeah. it, might, it might be from a uh, yeah i don't know where that came from well yeah. no i don't miss i don't really i really don't miss academia really i i mean this i've sort of created my own academia here this is like the the the, the university of box scholar <laughs> is what you see here i have my whiteboard i have my piano i have my computer i have my video camera i mean what what else would i need you know th this is what i do that now this is what i've been doing full time since 2012. Yeah. so in 2012 i resigned from my college position i resigned from a little bit before that i resigned from my organist position but later a few years later to end up playing organ in another church so um but it's uh th this is my whole world i just created my own little university here this is my own little academia right here and it's even better because i don't have to be on committees i don't have to be in meetings i you know i'm my own boss i can do what i want you know so and it, it couldn't be any better. I, I, I'm so lucky and blessed to have this sort of a lifestyle. I mean, I work hard. I, you know, I, you know, not, not to say that I'm at the beach every day or something. I happen to live just 10 minutes away from the beach also. So if I wanted to, I could go to the beach here in Florida, but I'm so busy doing things that I rarely have time to go to the beach. Unfortunately, I know so, my, my wife told me we got to find time to go to the beach this summer. You know? So we'll see. We'll see if we find time this year, because that's what she said last year. You'll have to check in and let and let us know whether you whether you made it. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, uh, Corey, it's been so good of you to, to give up some time. I wonder, like, aside from music, you know, I, I've seen you, you. I've seen you do a bit of cooking and all of that stuff. Like what? <laughs> um, what 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 do you do to take your mind off the music? I. I yeah, I like well, I do, I do like cooking. Um, um, I like, yeah, I cook my own food. I, I usually I, I routine. Yeah, I do this all day long. I either teach, work on my books, that sort of thing. I usually exercise in the morning, go for a long walk and that sort of thing. Um, other than that, other than my job, music, uh, well, usually, usually my wife Marilyn and I uh, watch TV at night, like most other people would. You know, watch television and you know have a couple glasses of wine. You know that that seems to be our sort of routine. You know, we, there's certain shows on TV we like to watch and you know things. Um, yeah, you know, very simple life. I'm uh, we're we're both homebodies. I'm a homebody and my wife is a homebody, so. We don't go out much, 
I mean, we, we probably should, <laughs> but I don't know. It seems like we're sort of like hermits or something. Um, but I do have interests. I have interests in, in health and nutrition. I have interests in cooking, like, like I said, you know, and then, then usually the shows we like to watch on TV are just mindless kind of shows, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know how that, that housewives of New Jersey or something oh, or, yes, uh, yes. classic or <laughs> date like, you know, murder mysteries or something, you know, <laughs> or lifetime movies, you know, uh, the, things you probably don't know what that is i i I confess i i don't but but netflix it seems unites us across oh we we want netflix yeah Yeah. lifetime movies are those uh they're here they're in the states they're mostly i'd say predominantly made for like middle-aged women like there are a lot of soap opera-ish type movies they're well-made movies with murders and affairs and and things like you know just really ridiculous situations uh you know like uh, there's one called stalked by my doctor you know <laughs> you know they're just but this they're i i just happen to love those kinds of movies they're not it's not intellectual okay you're not it's like i like to just unwind and watch like brainless kind of stuff you know on tv have a couple of glasses of wine you know we're very simple people we're we should get out more but we're sort of locked in this house doing our our thing with music. You know, my wife is a piano teacher also. So I teach in here. She teaches over there in the living room on her piano. And sometimes it sounds like a conservatory here. And, you know, I'll be practicing, she'll be practicing, or, or we'll be, both be teaching lessons at the same time or something. So it's very, very interesting, interesting life we live here in uh, Florida. <laughs> Dr. Corey Hall, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on on the on the all of the successes and and best of luck uh, for 2022 and moving. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me, Ben. And um, like to meet again sometime. So we'll 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 do it again in a few years and see see where I've I've gone then. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Okay.